Okay, I'm going to call House Human Services Finance and Policy Committee to order. And the first agenda item is to go through the roll call. So please um, unmute yourself for the roll call. Ms. Hansen? Okay. Good morning, everybody. Chair Schultz? Present. Vice Chair Bonner? Representative Albright? Present. Representative Bolden? Present. Representative Burkle? Present. Representative Fisher? Fisher, present. Thank you. Representative Frederick? Present. Representative Hansen? Present. Representative Keel? Uh, present. Present. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Liebling? Present. Representative Mueller? Present. Representative Noor? Representative Novotny. Present. Representative Pearson. Pearson present. Representative Pinto. Present. Representative Rasmussen. Present. Representative Robbins. Present. Representative Sandell. Present. Representative Schumacher. Present. Thank you all. Thank no you, Ms. We, we have Representative Noor present, Ms. Hansen. Thank you. Thank you for that. And we do have a quorum. Representative Hansen, would you like to move the minutes from January 20th? Sure. Thank you, Chairwoman Schultz. So moved. Thank you. So Representative Hansen moves approval of the minutes for January 20th, 2021. Any discussion or corrections? If not, please unmute yourself and we'll do a voice vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Okay, the motion prevails and the minutes are approved. Okay, today we have two presentations and several testifiers. The first presentation, we are gonna learn about becoming an age-friendly state in Minnesota. So we're gonna have a presentation from Anthony Taylor from the Governor's Council for Age-Friendly Minnesota. And the second presentation is about the Vulnerable Adults Act. So Mr. Taylor, are you available? Yes, good morning. Good morning, welcome to our committee. Please proceed. Thank you very much, thank you, good morning. Um, really a pleasure to be here this morning. Great pleasure of Mr. Serving. Taylor, we're having a problem hearing you. Could you get closer to the mic? Or sure can. Is that better? That's, that's better. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm saying I've, I had the uh, great pleasure of serving um, at, on the Governor's Council for an age-friendly Minnesota. Um, it's actually been an, I mean, a really uh, incredibly developmental opportunity because of the opportunity to work um, across different agencies. Um, in terms of my own work, I've done a lot of work specifically on um, youth, families, and equity, and, and the work on, on aging and what's happening in aging communities really has informed that work and has become uh, really important and foundational. So um, next slide, please. So since we began our work uh, in December of last year, uh, we were established uh, through the governor's actions, and we spent... Uh, those months really getting towards a series of recommendations. Um, we have actually um, finalized and proposed a consensus legislative language for it. Uh, we are now on the pathway of working towards establishing, um, I mean, or actually taking steps to enroll in the AARP uh, WHA organization this year and really working towards establishing uh, a permanent age-friendly Minnesota council, uh, making that recommendation this fall and then working towards um, having that permanent organization uh, go into effect in 2022. So next slide, please. The formation um, really, uh, uh, the governor's formation of this council uh, really leads to the question, and I think for us of um, why are we doing this? Um, and I think that, you know, we can speak to you know, we all really are aware of the demographics in, in 2022, in 2020, just this last year, for the first time, uh, our community members over age um, 60 actually outnumbered those under 18. So we are clear about the demographics. Uh, but we also have just gone through 
um, our pandemic. And, and, and in many cases, the pandemic itself really fundamentally exposed um, the many disparities. And I think that we have had a very particular uh, clarity around those things around race, but have not always been clear other than this idea of the, the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on Asian communities. And really, um, there are other areas of that. Uh, and in the context of pandemic, really there are additional um, proofs um, for that. Although it has had a staggering effect on Minnesota, um, it's really wreaked havoc on our long, long-term care facilities. And and just as it is, you know, and that's really a people of all ages, it's also created challenges in area from employment and financial security um, and really um, to isolation um, and connection in the community. You know, however, because of age, many Minnesotans will find it difficult to recover, you know, for them simultaneous health and economic setbacks. At the community level, we know both urban and rural communities have taken a proactive and coordinated approach uh, to plan and building of an age, a building uh, for an age-friendly population, and then really have been able to react to that. And one of the things that we found is those communities where there is already some age-friendly infrastructure, um, that their response was more coordinated um, and more impactful on those vulnerable communities. Um, one of those um, in Maple Grove, the age-friendly Maple Grove uh, community saw that the pandemic made affordable housing and accessible transportation more important than ever. And that, you know, that really they were able to pivot their work in the midst of the pandemic um, and really transitioning an existing, for example, dial a ride program to include food shelf and grocery delivery. Uh, in Northfield, um, our age-friendly organization there uh, developed a telemedicine uh, guide for elders um, and really were able to focus their uh, focus on communication and follow-up. Um, and they were able to send emergency services to residents. You know, and another a community that maybe isn't always considered relative to the disparities really was Alexandria and really an age-friendly group set up a friendly caller and video chat program for the elder network there. Next slide, please. The One of the things with this is that we really are looking at, you know, the work here has really been uh, cross organizational inside the state that we really have found um, that to be impactful. That the council is recommending a permanent council, you know, um, independent of any of these state agencies that is empowered, that the new agency will be empowered to coordinate across agencies and the private sector really to promote age friendly practices and policies. Um, and we're really pre uh, pleased that um, Representative. Uh, Lippert will be carrying the legislation forward uh, this year to create a permanent structure. And we look forward to working with him and all of you on this. One of the things for sure that we are clear about is the vast majority of people want to remain in their home and in their communities. So it's really critical that we're working across age and to do more uh, to help catalyze this work uh, at a local level. One of the uh, pieces of work, and it's interesting that that we are working in the city, actually, there's a, a huge response right now to what is happening in cultural communities relative to aging and some of the work that we're doing on housing in South Minneapolis, North Minneapolis, and the east side really reflects this new work. Our next slide, please. Our first recommendation really is to support our efforts uh, for the state to enroll in the WHO AARP network of age-friendly states and communities. Um, the work that we have been doing uh, makes this a clear um, you know, commitment for us um, that really the work that they've been doing, starting with an assessment and planning, um, you know, implementation, all of this leads to a, a strategy around continuous improvement. And this is really a very first step for, for us to achieve. Our next slide, please. One of the pieces of, of this uh, recommendations is really this idea of centering uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in all of our age-friendly work. Uh, we really are clear that the disparities um, are compounded, that we often use the word intersectional in our work to really come to uh, you know, really stronger strategies the key for us in this is that we know that there is a multiplicative effect when we are looking at including equity and inclusion as part of an age-friendly strategy. You know, we really have done been doing proactive work for a long time and that 
to date, more than 500 towns and cities and counties and six states have enrolled in our WHO network. We really see in Minnesota um, that the communities that have officially involved in the work in, in the network uh, and are at varying stages of the work are actually further along. And in their work, this new lens around equity and inclusion has really improved uh, the efficacy of the work and deepened the relationships that they have to the communities that have not always been a part of the main conversation, have been on, you know, been an outlier, and and that we um, see a greater impact in the work. Our next slide, please. Our recommendation three um, really is to provide the resources and support um, to the local communities uh, to adopt age-friendly policies and practices. Um, and this will take many uh, forms. One of the ones that we really have talked about is our grant making and really looking at streamlining this. But, but the key to this is really all the driven from um, a state level and through our independent bodies work all of the work happens locally, that we know that this is really the most effective way for us to administer the work and the most effective work for us to ingrain this work in uh, the communities that we are working in. Our next slide, please. Recommendation four, um, create a sustainable ongoing infrastructure within the administration to support age-friendly Minnesota work. Um, the idea is that the sole purpose um, is to focus on age-friendly work. Um, and really to lead the state's overall strategy and efforts. Again, working across agencies uh, really ensures, again, that our age-friendly work is going to be deeply ingrained in the work we do. We are seeing that this is going to be critical for us to, for the work long time. Again, our demographics are showing that this will be critical work. One of the elements of this that is really important as well is that we are sure that our work around working with age-friendly communities actually improves our quality and our efficacy around our support programming for all communities. Our next slide, please. Um, recommendation five really was for us the development of a framework and an analytical, analytical tool that state agencies can use to analyze their policies and programs through an age-friendly lens, uh, both in initial evaluation and ongoing analysis. Um, this really, um, for us, we have, an, an, you know, uh, tools for doing analysis early. It is an actually first step um, for us in all of the age-friendly work we're doing. And really what it does is it establishes uh, clearly a report card for us. Um, it establishes a dashboard for us in terms of the work around our two years enrollment and really metrics uh, for working comprehensively. The, 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 the tool around analysis one identifies those programs that are currently already engaged in communities. There is a lot of work happening in communities, but it does identify the gaps um, and then allows us to really channel our resources towards getting immediate and really effective impact as we begin work on age friendlies and policies in our individual and local communities. Next slide, please. One of the other things that we realized through our cross functional work was the importance of establishing a repository of resources um, that really can afford and uh, really inform the age-friendly Minnesota process and really an initiative for policymakers, for the public and professionals, um, really in the entire world of aging. Um, we really, again, find that there's a lot of work going on. There's a disconnected sometime aspect to the work. And sometimes the work around age friendly has been responsive. So again, by creating a repository, um, creating a proactive channel, uh, channel for this, really our stakeholders, which include all of our tribal liaisons, our state agencies, um, cultural navigators especially, um, give us access to the topics related to services, policies, and research um, in the age-friendly initiative itself, um, among others. Our next slide, please. One of the things that really came out as, um, as a result of the work, you know, really of us starting this work in the midst of the pandemic was really looking at emergency preparedness as a unique domain in our age-friendly work. Um, then really we uh, need to do an immediate assessment of our emergency plans, um, identify gaps and weaknesses. And again, the pandemic exposed this, but really um, with every emergency, because of the reality um, of our aging communities and how they live, 
um, and, the, and the challenges around for that unique challenges for that community. Um, emergency preparedness is something that we are clear about and it shows up in many ways. Uh, one of the um, uh, channels that we see in terms of isolation in communities and, and some of the work that I do, for example, uh, in the Twin Cities, we made a very strong pivot in, in some of our youth development work, for example, the Sani Foundation on the east side of St. Paul. And we did make a, a move towards um, a, a, a moving our efforts from youth work because of COVID-19 keeping kids at home from school and pivoted towards food distribution. Immediately as we pivoted that, the first thing we found in our analysis of data was that although um, you know, community members over 55 um, numbered roughly 18% of our geographic community, what we found in terms of the participants in our food distribution channels that was growing um, is that less than 3% were in that category. And what we found is that the ability to communicate with that community was a challenge. We didn't have specific channel, uh, communication strategies that the, um, the using technology, that the technology challenges for them were the greatest. Um, and again, isolation generally was a challenge for them. So we had to shift the ways that we communicated, uh, the delivery mechanisms for getting food uh, to them and having them take advantage of it. And by changing those policies and understanding it, we shared that with many people in the food distribution network and we saw this as around emergency preparedness uh, and a shift that we made in our service delivery. Next slide, please. We are making a recommendation really to develop a plan to integrate age-friendly work into the legislature and all relevant communities, uh, committees in the legislature. Um, that we really want to work to identify uh, proposals and priorities to align uh, and intersect with age-friendly Minnesota work, um, that this is really um, going to allow us to really uh, amplify the work that we're doing in policy and budgeting. Um, and really, again, it's going to be, as we do this, we will find that it reduces disparities and really promotes equity um, as well. And because with aging, we are always looking at equitable lens, it will integrate uh, very specifically into our BIPOC communities, uh, to communities that have been historically disenfranchised because of historical issues around um, really institutional and infrastructural racism, um, but really also uh, makes it inclusive um, in terms of outcomes for us. And next slide, please. The, the backbone of this really is our, um, you know, our work around the uh, eight domains of livable communities. Um, that what we've found is that communities in the network um, work to make improvements in their community to all or some combination of the eight domains of livability that include outdoor spaces and buildings, transportation, housing, uh, social improvement, um, respect and social inclusion, uh, civic participation, employment communication and information and community support and health services. The common thread among uh, you know, the enrolled communities and states is the belief that the places where we live are more livable and better able to support people of all ages uh, when, when our local leaders you know, commit to improving the quality of life for the very young and the very old and everyone in between. Uh, in Minnesota, nine communities have officially enrolled in the network and are at varying stages of work, while Minneapolis, Alexandria, Northfield, Maple Grove are in the process of implementing their age-friendly action plans. Uh, Hennepin County and Olmstead County, along with Brooklyn Park and St. Cloud and Princeton, are newly enrolled and in the beginning of the process of, of, of make, doing the assessments. And to date, the work of these communities has been delivered um, and really impressive, and I want to commend them and thank them for their work. Um, um, so with that, I will, um, you know, um, lend the floor to you. If you have questions, um, please uh, uh, ask. And we, uh, and I am here supported by additional team members that can answer uh, questions for you as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. This is important information to make sure that all of our older adults um, in Minnesota can thrive. I have a few questions and then I'll open it up to members. Um, one, is this a designation from an organization and where are we relative to other states? 
what is one of our AAR team members on? We can ask, but I think that this this designation um, right now, this is a designation again through the WHA, WHO, and the AARP Livable Communities Organizations, and th this is really going to be the first step for us in doing that. Currently, right now, we have just. Uh, the governor has just formed a council on aging, and that is really, this is the first result of the work that we are doing. And where are, how many other states already have the designation or are in the same stage we are at? Is our team on AARP can answer that for us. Is Will on? I want to make sure I get it right. I don't, I don't, they might not be on Mr. Taylor, but maybe they can follow up with me later. Yeah, and I can pull that up from there. Madam Chair, this is Nicole Stockert from DHS. I believe that we have um, Dan Pollock or Carrie Benson on if they thought that they could perhaps answer that question. Otherwise, I would be more than happy to follow up with you and the members of the committee with that information. Okay, Ms. Benson or Assistant Commissioner Pollock. Madam Chair and members, this is Carrie Benson, um, Director of the Aging and Adult Services Division at DHS and Executive Director of the Minnesota Board on Aging. And I believe there is close to 10 other states that have received this designation at this point. And so um, Minnesota is trying to, uh, we're, we're um, in support of the council's efforts to try to get in the mix of, of leading the way on this effort. Yeah, and I just uh, thank you confirm that there are actually 12 states that have received the designation currently. Okay, thank you, Ms. Benson and Mr. Taylor. One more question. Um, do when communities would like to do the, you know, undertake these initiatives, is there funding to support them at the federal level or the state level? You know, I do, I do not believe there is funding at the federal or state level to to go after that. But again, one of the things I mentioned was the AARP uh, grants. AARP is actually offering grants at a local level to actually support communities to move along this work. One uh, around the assessments um, and actually just a straight livable community strategy. So some of the work um, as they as they get started on it is actually very practical work. And a, a great example of that, for example, in South Minneapolis, um, where we're also doing work. I don't know if some of you may be familiar with the 38th Street Thrive work that's happening there. There's a, a, a long body of work that has come through the city council and led to the actual creation of our community development fund and a number of funded initiatives actually began with livable communities work with AARP Council on 38th Street that was really looking at increasing mobility for aging uh, community members. And so really the AARP grants um, that are started there are seeds for initial work looking at how do we increase efficacy and quality of life in very practical ways in those communities. So we offer grant funding uh, to, to see the, that work at that level. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. And I see Representative Sandel, go ahead with your question, please. Thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Taylor. Um, uh, among those 12 states that already have designation and active uh, uh, work on um, um, age-friendly um, uh, efforts, what are some of the programs that they've uh, instituted or initiatives they, they've taken to uh, um, provide a, uh, a more meaningful and I guess satisfying life for lots of, uh, uh, of us who are retired and um, um, not occupied with a, a regular job any longer? Well, you know, one Mr. Of the, Taylor? In, yeah, thank you. I think, you know, one of the, the I think it's interesting you, you say that re regarding the idea of being retired. Uh, one, of the, one of the programs that I see relatively consistent, consistently, for example, Boston has done a really interesting body of work um, related to the fact that many people in this age group are not stopping working. Right, that, that, that the idea around that idea um, is that people will be retiring is one of the ones that they have actually addressed. And again, again, exacerbated by COVID-19 that they are able to not work. So one of the programs has really been around that last stage of development, um, that they are actually taking uh, community members that are 60 years, 65 years plus, and they are actually going through workforce development programming, that they're looking at placement in terms of programming. Um, beginning programs around home ownership. Again, the you know that another area around home ownership and maintaining your home at this stage. I mean, we 
have found that, again, there is a sense that that after 65, after 75 years of age, um, that it is in the retirement. And really, the way that it is played out in terms of the economics of this time are very different. And so those two areas around kind of the financial and economic realities, and then the, the, the work around uh, a last stage in terms of workforce development are two of the programs I've seen, particularly Boston is one of the most interesting ones. And I think that we're seeing that in the Twin Cities and in rural communities as well, where we are really working with community members to um, find uh, this stage of life, what does work look like in this stage of life? Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Representative Sandal, do you have any follow-up question? Well, thank you. Nothing special, I guess. Uh, uh, well, campaigning the last uh, two um, um, election cycles, I, uh, I've spoken about uh, the importance of a, of a meaningful and satisfying life for older citizens. And uh, I represent um, uh, Woodbury, and there are a number of um, um, uh, communities with large numbers of uh, uh, older citizens. Some uh, continue to work and some retire. We also have a couple of um, uh, um, homes for retired people that provide other services. But uh, I'm, I, I certainly am interested in, in the work that we might be able to do or can do or can initiate, I guess, for uh, a, an older population, which uh, A, can continue to uh, be employed and uh, B, um, uh, maybe retired from their profession, but to still want to be uh, actively involved in their community. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Sandal. We're always eager to have new members work on these issues. I believe Representative Albright had his hand up. Go ahead, Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Sandell, you are also a, a, a fan of history, and so I should remark on the fact that uh, retirement is an invented word uh, that actually was created in order to culturally shift people out of the workforce into something else to allow for uh, younger generations to come up through the ranks. Um, having spent 25 years in the financial services industry, uh, retirement was a, 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 word, a code word for uh, end of life to, to some extent. So Mr. Taylor, rather than uh, possibly using the word retirement, um, I might suggest that you uh, consider using the phrase changing your course or doing something different. Um, I know of a number of 80 and 90 year olds that are probably more active than uh, some 20 and 30 year olds based upon their uh, refusal or their non-acceptance of um, the status quo. Uh, but to my question, Mr. Taylor, you posted a slide uh, very early on in your deck, and I'm wondering if you could pull that up for me just for one moment. You know, I was not controlling the deck, so... Um, I believe Ms. Docker, can, Ms. Docker can pull that up. What, do you know the number? Or, I think it was the second or third one in, Madam Chair. You talked about the graph uh, of progression uh, talking about the the, the, the uh, timeline, the timeline. Yes, that one. Uh, mm -hmm. Keep going forward. It's like two more in. It's the one with the red arrow on it, Mike. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Taylor, when we talk about this in in, to, in terms of a five year uh, implementation program, um, I, I must say that this. Uh, uh, has the look and feel of a an agency type of report uh, towards uh, fulfilling uh, some unknown obligation with funding and that type of thing um, for the members on this committee. This is uh, striking eerily similar to how the Met Council got its start back in the in the '60s. So I would just warn us of that. Uh, all uh, good intentions uh, set aside. My question, Mr. Taylor, is. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of the WHO ARP network of age-friendly states, and I'm wondering if you might share for the committee uh, their uh, 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 foundational principles, uh, paperwork that uh, actually established them. Uh, what is their mission statement? What are the guiding principles that govern their activities? What is their uh, mission uh, in, in the life of their agency? I think that's imperative for this organization to appreciate uh, going forward in terms of how we might be helpful. It's certainly laudable to work on efforts to increase the uh, uh, availability of services and, and, and whatnot to an aging population in Minnesota. Um, but I think that should be up to the individual rather than for 
the creation of another council that uh, candidly already has uh, footprints in a number of our other uh, state agencies. So not as a, a, a cut to your efforts, which are you know, commendable, but I do think that uh, the due diligence on this organization is something that we should start with uh, to have a, a backstop in terms of moving forward. And I'll, I'll just leave it at that, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Albright, for your comments. Uh, Mr. Taylor, did you want to comment on, on his questions? You know, I, and, I, and I guess what I would uh, commit to do is get back and I can share the uh, you know, actual information related to the WHO and really their, their work around age-friendly communities. Um, and I think that, again, um, it really, I, I think in some regards, it really is looking at the idea of, of actually age-friendly practice. Um, and I think, you know, I, I really actually appreciate your initial comments uh, related to um, what it is we're talking about in stage of life. Right, that it really is, you know, is maybe that, and I think that I really agree with you. I think I am thinking about in terms of stage of life and what are the priorities in that stage of life. And what we really see is that, um, you know, ageism is real. Like, I, I really appreciate your comment that really retirement, that there is a particular way that we as a society view end of life and when that happens and your value at that point to the community. And, and part of what we're and part of what we're saying and what you're reminding us of is that your value to the community at that point may be its highest opportunity in terms of impacting what's going on. And so what we have to do is reverse a culture that says that isn't true, right? That much of what we're doing when we're talking about age-friendly community is is really working on that. And, and not only that, with the, the culture of the community, there's also an internalized aspect around ageism that actually may be more sinister than those aspects that exist in our infrastructure, uh, you know, in, in the community itself. And those internalized aspects in terms of your self-worth at that point in your life. And right now, the way that we view work, the way that financial resources are set up, many of those things play themselves out for those communities. So... I think that the ultimate piece of the work around age friendliness is really impacting, uh, you know, that work uh, there in terms of what's happening in the culture of our communities and the way that we view it and the way we view value of citizens at that stage of life. And then how are we prioritizing and investing and realizing, as you make very clear, is that, that the value of those citizens at that stage of life may be the highest value and we need to connect to their wisdom, um, their energy uh, and the opportunity for us to grow as a community because we value them as citizens. Madam Chair, Thank you, I would just have one follow up for Mr. Taylor. Go, go ahead, he, Representative Albright. He uh, remarked on a word that I've not heard before uh, this morning and I'm just wondering where the genesis for that word is, uh, ageism. Uh, Mr. Taylor, I'm wondering if you could remark on what, uh, what the purpose and usage, uh, what's the definition of ageism? It, re it really, you know, yeah, I mean, ageism, um, you know, really re relates to this idea of those uh, stereotypes um, and really the characteristics of and value based on aging, based on age, right? The, the disproportionate value of a human life based on the stage of life that you're in um, and then a, in, a, in a particular view of your potential um, as, a, as a human. So that really, that's, that's the genesis of that word. Um, and again, I'm, I'm using in the context of looking at the valuation of you as a human, your contribution to society based on age. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Representative Moeller. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Mr. Taylor, um, I was looking at the graph with the state agencies and um, just wondering about public safety and noticing that that wasn't on there. And I know our next presentation is going to be about exploitation of vulnerable adults, but I just was curious if you could talk about um, public safety for our aging population. Mr. Taylor. Yeah, thank you. And I, yeah, thank you very much. That actually uh, is, and it isn't, it's interesting, it isn't listed as an agency, um, but it was something that was integral to the conversation, right? And that, that was what I would say is that many, uh, multiple um, agencies represented public safety and really talked about it. And, and it really, it, it, if it was transportation or if it was housing or, you know, if it was MDH themselves, we really found out that public safety was a critical part of it. And, and really the perception of safety by, the, by aging communities is um, something that is really a, is, is important and a high priority. And, and even something as simple as um, how we're promoting active living 
uh, for those communities. One of the great challenges around active living, one of the great challenges around us designing public spaces, parks, um, and our connection to outdoors is really uh, a perception of public safety and vulnerability by Asian communities. So it, public safety is really, I think, uh, baked into really priorities of a multiple agencies. And, and again, it's something that we were clear about as well. Representative Muller, any follow-up? No, thank you for your presentation, Mr. Taylor. I don't see any other questions from members, but we appreciate all the work you're doing in this space and we look forward to getting updates periodically um, in the future. So thank you and your team. Yeah. Thank you for the time and uh, thank you all for your work. Okay, members, our next presentation is on Minnesota's Vulnerable Adults Act. So we have um, Director, the Director of Aging and Adult, Ser Adult Services Division of DHS, Ms. Carrie Benson, if you can share your slides and, and proceed. She's also the Executive Director of the Minnesota Board on Aging. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, I'm happy to be here with you today to provide an overview of the state's Vulnerable Adult Act. Um, again, for introductory purposes and for the record for the meeting, my name is Carrie Benson, Director of the Aging and Adult Services Division um, in uh, the uh, Department of Human Services. And within that division is the Adult Protection Program, which I'll be talking about um, primarily here today. But I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to have some time uh, with you all today and your um, interest in learning about the Vulnerable Adult Act and how it creates a system of protection for vulnerable adults in our communities, and including those who participate in services and facilities licensed by DHS, um, Department of Human Services, and the Minnesota Department of Health. Next slide. So I will um, follow this, uh, this outline throughout my presentation to try to um, break up the different components of the Vulnerable Adults Act. And I will be providing an overview of these functions that are outlined within um, different sections of Minnesota statute um, uh, that make up the Vulnerable Adult Act. So I will be uh, explaining how reporting occurs how um, reports are referred, and then the response to reports that are undertaken. And um, first and foremost, I want to be sure to emphasize that the Vulnerable Adult Act encourages reporting based on a suspicion that someone who is a vulnerable adult was abused, neglected, or financially ex exploited. And um, protections exist then to protect the identity of reports, but that's first and foremost. Um, the, the work that we do is to really encourage reports of um, potential maltreatment. Next slide. So in terms of that first um, function being um, the, the submittal of reports of potential maltreatment, um, that's where we'll start. Reports are made to the Minnesota Adult Abuse Reporting Center, we refer to as the MARC. That is operated by the Department of Human Services um, within my division um, through a contracted vendor. And the MARC was established, it was first authorized and established then in 2015. Um, and so that was the first uh, time that the state moved um, from a county-based reporting system. There at the time, prior to the MARC, there was 168 reporting numbers um, and we moved then into a centralized uh, reporting system, which uh, we call the, the MARC. And so now what we have in place is a single toll-free number for the public to use to, um, to call in and, uh, and submit reports of potential maltreatment of vulnerable adults. And then the MARC also has web reporting for mandated reporters to also submit reports of suspected maltreatment. And this provides then the infrastructure to take in um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, those, those reports. The MARC um, accepts those reports, refers those reports to lead investigative agencies, which I'll explain here in, in a few minutes. 
and also makes um, the required notifications to other entities that are involved in the adult protection system. Next slide, please. This slide contains a lot of information. Um, and so I, I trust that that will be available um, and these slides will be available for your reference later. And hopefully in that way will also be helpful, but it's a, it's a really um, important uh, diagram and picture of the system at a, at a high level in terms of the, the flow of reports um, into the mark and then um, where those reports are then referred. Um, you'll see at the top of the screen, NHIR reports. Those are reports um, that have um, are federally required reports um, submitted um, uh, that the Minnesota Department of Health has, that those are transmitted electronically to the MARC. The MARC, again, also is receiving in then the public and other mandated reporters um, reports coming in. Every report is processed and referred electronically then to the civil lead investigative agency. You'll see those indicated in the um, box at the bottom of the screen, boxes at the bottom of the screen. So every report um, is, is processed and referred electronically um, to a civil lead investigative agency. There are three of those that includes the county adult protection system and, and those programs at the county level, the Minnesota Department of Health and DHS licensing. Statute allows two working days for this referral, but the mark is operating within a four hour service level as far as making those reports or the referrals, I'm sorry, within a four hour um, time frame. If a report includes a risk of imminent harm to a vulnerable adult, um, regardless of the lead investigative agency, then that report is immediately referred to county adult protection for emergency adult protective services. If the allegation may also be a crime, immediate notification is made to law enforcement. And then finally, if there is a sus suspicious death reported, um, law enforcement medical examiner in the Office of Ombudsman for Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities are notified. Next slide. And we also want to briefly touch on what the mark does not do, just as a point of clarification um, regarding the, the functions that are included in the mark scope of, of authority and responsibility as outlined in the Vulnerable Adult Act. So the mark does not screen reports in terms of making any decisions about the reports that are submitted into the mark. Um, in fact, they, the, the mark call center staff um, following uh, guidelines that we provide to them. They accept all reports and they refer all reports to the lead investigative agencies for then their, um, the work that they do regarding those reports. The MARC um, does not uh, do the work of a lead investigative agency. It does not perform investigations, make determinations or assign blame. And the MARC does not replace or substitute for 911. Next slide. Moving on to the next um, component of uh, the presentation for today and providing you with this overview is the, that referral uh, step in the process. So as I have said, MARC reports are referred to the appropriate LIA, Lead Investigative Agency, and that is, those are the entities, and you'll see them outlined here again, Adult Protective Services at the county level, the Minnesota Department of Health, and then the Department of Human Services. OIG is Office of Inspector General, and that also includes a licensing division. LIAs are responsible for decisions on how to respond um, to the reports that they receive. And then, as I said, County Adult Protection is also responsible for emergency protection. And the LIA is, primary, is a primary administrative agency responsible for, um, for immediately responding to a report re that is referred to them by the MARC. They use their agency's prioritization guidelines for deciding which reports require investigation. 
and they also make required notification. Next slide. A key step in the, in the screening and intake process that each of the lead investigative agencies undertakes is determining a person's vulnerable adult status. This is the key first step. And so we have listed here, um, uh, as outlined in the Vulnerable Adult Act, there are two types of vulnerable adults, categorical and functional. Both identify that a vulnerable adult must be 18 years old or older. And I won't go into um, the definitions uh, here right now um, in, for the sake of time, um, but we can, we can circle back to that uh, later or if there are questions. Next slide. Another key step in the process that each lead investigative agency undertakes and is also um, defined in statute is um, the type of maltreatment. And here you'll see we have three categories of abuse, self or caregiver neglect, and financial exploitation. Um, within the definitions um, of abuse, we have physical abuse, sexual abuse, and emotional abuse. Within neglect, um, we want to highlight that there is both caregiver neglect, which is a failure or omission by a caregiver that results in the deprivation of care or services, which are reasonable and necessary to maintain the vulnerable adults, mental, emotional, or physical health and safety versus self-neglect, which is the act or omission by a vulnerable adult themselves that results or could result in the deprivation of food, shelter, clothing, health care, supervision, which is reasonable and necessary to maintain their health and safety um, when there is no caregiver with the responsibility for that. So a key aspect within this section of the Vulnerable Adult Act is the definition of a caregiver. Um, and that includes a spouse or sibling or child of a vulnerable adult. Um, that the, the um, explanation here, I should say, includes that, that individuals such as a spouse or sibling or child of a vulnerable adult does not add, automatically make a person a caregiver. A person has to actually meet the definition of a caregiver um, within statute for caregiver neglect to be considered. A caregiver has responsibility to provide the food, shelter, clothing, health care, or supervision. And then again, if there's no caregiver um, present, then it may be self-neglect. Um, so this is where, as you can tell by the, the explanation that I am, I am uh, trying to make here and the clarification that I'm trying to make, this is, it's difficult in terms of making these determinations. Um, and it's, it's difficult to make sure that an identified caregiver meets a definition of, of a caregiver. And moving on to the third category of financial exploitation, there are distinctions here regarding fiduciary financial exploitation and non-fiduciary exploitation. Um, so, so there are distinctions here that, um, that, that matter in terms of um, the impact to a vulnerable adult if that if a particular um, uh, situation um, meets the definitions of maltreatment in each of these categories, um, including financial exploitation. And what we need to remember is that adult protective services is very specific to vulnerable adults. So for example, if a scam is carried out on a vulnerable adult, um, it would be considered financial exploitation, non-fiduciary. If a scam is carried out on an elder who does not meet the definition of a vulnerable adult, it is still theft. So just as a very high level um, you know, explanation and um, some examples here is just in indicating the complexity um, within the Vulnerable Adult Act and what um, the lead investigative agencies each do um, a great deal of work to, um, to support, you know, consistent uh, determinations and um, uh, 
uh, and then related responses. Next slide. Switching gears a little bit here, then we wanted to share with you all um, the, uh, the status of vulnerable adult um, uh, reports to the mark. And so these are um, reports of um, suspected maltreatment um, received into the mark. And we're comparing um, uh, both 2019 uh, volume of reports to 2020 volume of reports. Reports for all lead investigative agencies were down by 13% um, in 2020 as compared to 2019, and down 16% during the first 10 months of 2020. So in particular, those that, um, that portion of uh, uh, last year saw you know, a bit more of a dramatic decrease in comparison to the volume of reports that were received in 2019, pre-pandemic, I will, I will note. Um, next slide. You'll also see these um, report numbers uh, being broken down here by lead investigative agencies. So this again is comparing calendar year 2019 to calendar year 2020 reports. Um, those reports that were referred by the MARC to County Adult Protective Services uh, were down in 2029% from the year 2019 reports. The reports referred to the Minnesota Department of Health um, that uh, involved reports of potential maltreatment within the facilities or providers that they license was down 21% from 2019. And likewise, for the DHS um, licensed facilities and those reports of potential maltreatment, those were down 10% from 2019. Next slide. This slide indicates that um, vulnerable adults of any age, 18 and older, are subject to um, and, and included in reports of potential maltreatment and then determined to um, have substantiated reports of maltreatment. Um, you'll see here that um, this is just for reports referred from the MARC to County Adult Protective Services as one of the three lead investigative agencies in 2019. Um, and, and this slide is, is just to, to show across the different types of alleged potential maltreatment, um, the uh, proportion of those reports um, that involve um, individuals who are vulnerable adults in each of these age um, categories. Next slide. Stepping back a little bit more high level here, in terms of Minnesota's vulnerable adult protection system, it is important to know and to, to keep in mind as we um, explore various aspects of the system and as we, with our partners, um, in particular the counties, but our other stakeholder partners, look to areas for for improvement and for um, enhancing the work that we do together to protect um, and support vulnerable adults. It's important to, to know that Minnesota's adult protection system is county administered and state supported or state supervised. Um, nationally, most adult protection programs are administered by the state. So in fact, the um, the uh, work um, that I have been delineating as county adult protection services roles are in fact done at a state agency and, and um, through the work of state staff. So in contrast with that, um, the Department of Human Services role as uh, supervising and supporting county administered adult protection systems 
um, services uh, takes a different um, uh, a, an, a different approach in that DHS, we encourage reporting. We operate the mark through a contracted vendor. We provide the technology system um, and the, the, the data tracking system uh, for use by the counties and the mark, which is a social services information system. We provide structured decision-making tools and um, training. We support compliance um, and, and other aspects related to supporting and, and um, supervising the county's role in, in the adult protection system. Next slide. In the county administered adult protective services, they, they do wear numerous hats. I want to stress this. They have a, a great deal of responsibility and very important work that they do. And, and it's a complicated um, uh, set of roles, dual roles that they, that they uh, fulfill because they have a mandate to both provide social services as well as investigate alleged maltreatment. And, and these roles can potentially be in conflict. Um, in terms of providing social services, they work to engage um, the vulnerable adult and their support system to assess strengths and needs. They offer supports, services, solutions to potential issues and, and challenges um, that that vulnerable adult and their um, support uh, system is experiencing. But then they also serve as an investigator when they are receiving reports of potential maltreatment. Um, they have to gather facts um, and, and do, do conduct interviews and review records to assess um, whether or not um, the reported allegation is true. And in fact, then uh, make that determination and assign blame or not assign blame. So one example of um, of this dual mandate being in conflict is a self-neglect case. And Adult Protective Services investigates the person. Um, in this instance, they're investigating the person they are trying to engage in services. Um, another example is when a family member is alleged responsible for maltreatment, Adult Protective Services must investigate the family and notify them if they are determined responsible for, mal for maltreatment but at the same time then engage the family in actions to stop and remediate the maltreatment and help to heal the family they've been investigating. So you'll see with that example in particular that it is, it's, it's a complicated um, role with um, potential conflicts included. So, you know, the bottom line is that in adult protection, both you know, at the state level and in our partnership with counties, we want to stop maltreatment of vulnerable adults. Our other partners in the system want to do the same and, and prevent it from happening again. Um, you know, and it certainly can be argued that both social services and investigation provide avenues to stop and prevent um, maltreatment. However, again, there are times when uh, these roles um, can be a challenge in terms of you know, how well uh, the county um, adult protection services staff are able to establish relationships necessary for um, clients, for vulnerable adults to engage with social services, you know, that we're trying to introduce. Um, and so, you know, it's important to, to um, keep that in mind and have, um, have that awareness of the, of the difficult work um, that they do and how that is um, outlined in the Vulnerable Adult Act in terms of those mandates. Next slide. A little bit more here about um, adult protective services and, the in, and then the interventions, service interventions that they are able to undertake. Um, and it's all about improving the safety and quality of life as defined by the person, by the vulnerable adult themselves, and to reduce risk of re-victimization. So, um, interventions uh, may be offered to all vulnerable adults um, for MARC reports, um, accepted for investigation and um, adult protective services, regardless of the investigation finding. Um, so that's really, you know, an open, open door and, a, and opportunity 
that county adult protective services, um, uh, you know, take advantage of when, when they can uh, provide services to really strengthen um, the, the situation uh, uh, in which an individual who is a vulnerable adult is, is living, it really strengthen and support their, their services network, whether that might be um, caregiver education or support, um, case management, maybe um, other uh, more formal paid home and community-based services, um, medical and or mental health evaluation or services, domestic abuse services, um, family counseling or mediation, um, referral to an ombudsman program, you know, so really um, a pretty wide range. And those are voluntary interventions, a pretty wide range of, of interventions available and then involuntary interventions um, can be initiated by and are initiated by adult protective services workers when that is necessary and without the consent of the affected adult for the purposes of protecting and safeguarding um, the vulnerable adult at risk of abuse, neglect, or exploitation. And so we list those here um, and in really are undertaken um, when in situations when an individual has an ongoing lack, ongoing case of lack of capacity, um, or it's, it's in the situation of a medical emergency that impacts their capacity, or when a client is in danger to themselves or others because of a mental health issue. So again, um, uh, very uh, um, deliberate um, determinations by county APS um, to undertake these involuntary interventions, but they are available to them in their responsibility to take as needed. Next slide. The system of, of adult protective services um, uh, through the counties is funded um, um, in a, through a variety of sources and all of which um, uh, were not um, the, the, the system itself was not, was not established and, and funded with um, adult protective services dedicated funding. Um, so there are um, some federal social service block grants dollars that are um, directed to adult protective services at the county level. Um, state grants were allocated under state statute in 2013. Um, dedicated to adult protective services. And then local governments um, funds, county funds are, are also invested on, on top of those two other funding sources to really support adult protective services at the county level, the real local level. And we're happy to um, share with you that the first dedicated federal adult protective services funding was, was included in the most recent federal COVID relief bill signed in December of 2020. This is COVID related one-time funding at this point, but we are crossing our fingers that that might lead the way to um, ongoing federal funding through the US Administration for Community Living uh, for Adult Protective Services. And so, um, and so we are continuing to um, uh, support with and really partner with our counties to support this system with the um, funding sources available to us at this time. Next slide. I wanted to spend the, the remainder of, of my time uh, providing you with an overview of a very exciting initiative that we have been undertaking for the last couple of years in partnership with um, a very wide range of stakeholders, including our counties um, in the adult protection system um, to identify and really come to uh, a consensus around what we see as the vision for adult protection and for the system of services to support our vulnerable adults and uh, what changes are needed to really achieve that, that vision. Um, in 1980, the Vulnerable Adult Act was designed for a facility-based system of care. And so 
that's been um, that's been in place for quite a long time, and we're seeing um, with changing demographics and uh, areas of um, uh, potential conflict and and um, complexity in how the system is set up now that there are um, some challenges that we with our partners in the field are very um, uh, interested in um, working together to identify and address. And so what we've done, um, and we'll go to the next slide, is what we've done is worked um, worked through a process to um, really hear from our stakeholders about um, adult protective services. And so we really focus this redesign effort on county adult protective services um, and, and worked through um, a multi-stage process to get input into what do our stakeholders want to see um, in, in a system into the future and, and what does that look like? How can we get there? And so this um, slide in front of you hopefully provides a clear de delineation in terms of our focus for this um, APS redesign. But I also want, want you to know that we've been um, collaborating and uh, working closely with um, our partners at the state level, um, DHS licensing, as well as the Minnesota Department of Health to um, make sure that we're staying in touch with them about our redesign efforts and we're identifying areas for um, coordination and further exploration. Next slide. This slide uh, shows uh, visually the, the two phases, two main phases of efforts that we've undertaken to engage with stakeholders. The first phase involved a contract that we had with um, public sector consultants and they conducted a thorough review of other states and national policies um, regarding adult protection services other models, as well as best practices. And they conducted our first round of interviews with key stakeholders. So they, um, they compiled all of that information in a report um, for us that, that then we shared broadly. And it really um, served to inform then the second phase of our stakeholder engagement process. This has been a much more um, uh, thorough phase and uh, much more in depth within the state here in terms of tapping our stakeholders um, and getting their insights. Ms. Next Benson, slide. I'm going to ask you to maybe wrap it up in the oh, next minute because we have one more presenter. Absolutely, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Let's go to um, let's go to slide um, 21, if we could, Nicole. And I will um, allow you all to, um, of course, refer back to the slides we just skipped here. They go into more detail regarding the stakeholder groups, including um, uh, individuals receiving services and advocates that we received input from. And I will instead then focus on, for the redesign, those recommendations that were completely supported by members of our solution groups, which was our last phase of input, um, and the solution group members were wholeheartedly supportive of these recommendations to um, make improvements to our system of supports for vulnerable adults. Um, and you'll see they span everything from increasing awareness um, including and with particular attention to underserved communities, as well as offering support, allowing preventive services to be offered at any point, revising some of these key definitions, allowing alternatives to investigations, especially in the cases of self-neglect, and then really beefing up the quality assurance function that is in place for the state. Next slide. These solutions then, or I should say recommendations, were the ones that were mostly supported or highly supported by our solution group members in this last phase of our work. Again, very important components um, that uh, stakeholders really um, came together on and, and wanted to raise up as far as maintaining the rights of individuals, supporting and expanding collaboration and data sharing, 
supporting and expanding multidisciplinary teams, um, but not requiring them, align our system with the federal guidelines, and then establishing that quality assurance functions to review um, adult protection services decisions. So again, a, another set of very important recommendations that we are hearing from our stakeholders. And with that, um, Madam Chair and members, I will um, conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Director Benson. And I see two questions from members. I'm gonna ask if you can hold your questions till we get through the next presentation. And I know I'm sure Director Benson will, will stick around. So the next presenter is Amanda Vickstrom. She's, she's the executive director for the Minnesota Elder Justice Center. Welcome, Director Vickstrom, and please proceed with your presentation. And we have about 10 minutes for your presentation. I apologize. Nope, I, that's what I planned for, so that's not a problem. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, my name is Amanda Vickstrom. I'm the executive director at the Minnesota Elder Justice Center, and I just want to thank you and the NDHS for giving us time to give our thoughts on Minnesota's adult protection system and then the Vulnerable Adult Act. The Minnesota Elder Justice Center was established in 2014 and we're a nonprofit organization. We're located in the Twin Cities and have staff in greater Minnesota as well. Um, we serve older Minnesotans and their families who are experiencing elder abuse, vulnerable adult abuse, neglect, financial exploitation, and our nine staff work across um, the vulnerable adult elder abuse spectrum to address elder abuse by focusing primarily in three areas, victim services, education and technical assistance, and then policy and systems change. We are just a handful of statewide elder justice centers in the nation. We have a unique perspective on elder abuse and vulnerable adult maltreatment because we're the only statewide nonprofit providing this confidential advocacy service for individuals and family members who are really trying to navigate the complex maze of services before, during, and after instances of abuse and neglect. And I wanna use my time today to just highlight two key concepts for you to consider as you contemplate legislation in this committee that will affect older and vulnerable adults at risk of or experiencing abuse. So first, elder and vulnerable adult abuse is a complex public health problem, and it's not going to be solved by just justice, justice systems alone or a social service systems alone. So our office in many ways is a complement to the adult protection system that Ms. Benson outlined earlier. Many of the people that we work with have encountered the system in one way or another. And when victims call us, they need an advocate to listen to them and to support them, and then really to provide them systems navigation skills that let them figure out their options as they choose how to proceed. So victims tell us they need to not only help figure out the system itself, but also support because along with the abuse that they or a loved one are facing, they are frustrated, they're fatigued, they're experiencing shame. Um, and this is often sort of new territory for many of, the, many of them as they're reaching out to us. Um, as was noted earlier, the Vulnerable Adult Act defines in statute various types of maltreatment. In our work, elder abuse, it can be physical abuse, emotional, sexual abuse, maltreatment, neglect, financial exploitation, or using threats or coercion to gain control over that older adult's life. So in addition, we serve older adults regardless of their vulnerability, often working with older victims who, don't, who, who do not necessarily fall into those APS guidelines of vulnerability. 91% of our 625 victims last year were over the age of 60, and of those, 43% had no cognitive, mental, or physical disability. And elder abuse is, is much more common than we may be led to believe if we haven't uh, experienced it personally with, an, with a family or a friend. Data in the field really remains difficult to collect and confirm, but research tells us that about 10% of people over the age of 60 will be a victim of elder abuse at some point during their lifetime. And when you add in some sort of cognitive uh, limitation, disability, dementia, that risk goes to one in five. When looking specifically at financial exploitation and scams, which we hear a lot about, research varies, but on the very low end, 
uh, data tells us that older adults lose over $3 billion each year uh, just due to financial exploitation. And then additional research tells us that one in 24 cases of elder abuse, neglect, financial exploitation are ever actually even reported to authorities. It's very underreported. Anecdotally, this is con consistent with the shame that many of our own clients share. Uh, they share that they want the abuse to stop, but there's a, a concern over not wanting to get a perpetrator, often a loved one, in trouble. Another key element when addressing elder abuse is to recognize that older adults who are experiencing abuse often experience more than one type of abuse at a time. So it's, it's known as poly victimization. And when an older adult or a vulnerable adult is experiencing say financial exploitation, they are also probably experiencing some other forms of abuse like emotional abuse, control over their living situation or threats for their physical well-being. We see victims present to us with layered multiple forms of abuse occurring at the same time. It's really important to remember that elder abuse occurs in every community in this state and it affects every racial and socioeconomic demographic. So in our work last year, about 24% of our clients were in greater Minnesota with 69% residing in the metro area. We served clients in 55 of our 87 counties and of our nine staff currently, uh, four of those positions are direct service positions. So we, 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 are, we are a small nonprofit filling a gap. Um, it's a really important to note that abuse and neglect occurring in greater Minnesota can present especially difficult challenges because of increased isolation, lack of resources for interventions. Um, many times uh, the community members know each other intimately and so um, service providers know families who are calling um, and, it, and, and maybe related to them and it's layered. Uh, in addition, another thing to remember is that communities, particularly communities of color, already disenfranchised by health or socioeconomic disparities, they face additional barriers in accessing resources. We know that providing prevention and intervention services for victims and families requires cultural competency and cultural humility, and many victims find it really hard to report this abuse in the first place, um, let alone trust others or the system to help them. So, the challenges with elder abuse are actually compounded by the fact that the perpetrators of this abuse are most often people with whom the victim knows well, so family or friends. And while near everyone is familiar with the senior scams that we talked a little bit about, the reality is that most perpetrators of abuse and exploitation will be someone known to the victim. So some estimates, national estimates, indicate that two thirds of the perpetrators are these trusted family members and friends. And I will say that these statistics are similarly reflected in our own work. Perpetrators vary, but in many cases of elder abuse, there are elements of power and control within the abuse and many cases involve a relative or trusted person as the perpetrator. So consider, for example, um, this example that uh, can demonstrate sort of the types of calls that we receive and frankly, the cases that APS investigates as well. So say an adult daughter moves in with the promise to care for her aging father. And as soon as siblings, um, soon after siblings find out that money is disappearing from dad's account and they're concerned about uh, the daughter's increased chemical dependency issues, dad is not getting to his doctor's appointments, uh, dad is expressing concern or stress and the adult child refuses to move out. So we respond to this and other similar scenarios on a regular basis. And as you work through this committee over the next two years, we would encourage you to help develop and support legislation that helps those experiencing and responding to these complex cases. Particular areas of emphasis include investments in DHS programs to help with APS and other advocates interventions, such as cash supports, housing supports, and home and community-based services and investments and practices such as supported decision-making. So the promise of, it's a promising method of maltreatment prevention and mitigation, and it allows for an older adult to balance their safety and autonomy without necessarily pushing this person into an overly restrictive guardianship. Moving quickly to the second topic, the field of elder justice has lacked large scale federal and state investments that other systems like child protection have received. 
So the adult protection system relies primarily on county funds. This can lead to disparate outcomes and services to older and vulnerable adults, and it's based simply on where that older adult lives. Even if we were to fully fund our adult protection system, it can't be the only way we serve vulnerable and older adults who are experiencing maltreatment. APS responses will largely be after-the-fact responses and may not be able to provide enough services to solve those root issues. So consider the example that I highlighted earlier. Cases like that are referred to local adult protection, but for a variety of reasons, that APS office may not ultimately be able to solve the problem. And so this is where sometimes our office can assist. So that adult daughter that moved in with promises to care for her aging father, so say adult protection does an investigation, but perhaps makes a finding of inconclusive, or perhaps APS determines that the dad doesn't meet the statutory definition of vulnerable adult. Either way, family members are confused as to why their sister is getting away with the crime, uh, law enforcement may have closed the investigation, and dad wants the situation resolved, but is scared of what will happen to his adult child. This example just highlights sort of the limits of the adult protection system and also highlights the importance of programs like ours, as well as broader investment areas um, highlighted by the National Elder Justice Roadmap. Uh, research, policy, training, education, and um, direct services. And in, like most parts of our social safety net, the pandemic has revealed tremendous gaps in our system, exposing more acutely the risk factors that can lead to maltreatment. We have actually experienced a 19% increase in calls in our office in 2020, and they pretend higher rates of social isolation, housing instability, abuse and neglect in a victim's own home, and increased barriers to seek help for populations that are really reticent to ask for it. Um, as you consider legislation, we need to emphasize research in this area with a particular focus on preventative and an upstream approach. We need to invest in programs that combat known risk factors for maltreatment like social isolation. And finally, I'd ask that you consider when we invest in things like mental health services that expand access, chemical dependency services, food supports, housing stability, it can be a positive ripple effect for older victims and their families, including the perpetrators who often need some form of help themselves um, suffering through these abusive situations. In closing, I wanna emphasize that uh, the Minnesota Elder Justice Center is here for a resource as you consider these policies in these areas and also for your constituents who uh, might be dealing with these issues. Again, thank you, Chair Schultz, uh, DHS, and members for your time. I can stand for any questions. Thank you, Director Vickstrom. Really appreciate that. We have about eight minutes left, so I'm going to have Representative Robbins ask her question and then Representative Rasmussen. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I want to go back to the previous um, witness just for a moment. Um, you referenced that in the most recent COVID federal package, that money was um, designated specifically for adult protective services. And I wondered how much of that is coming to Minnesota and do you, who distributes it? Is that up to your office and how will it be distributed to the counties? Is it per capita or is there some other formula? Thank you. Director Benson. Madam Chair and members, uh, there is um, a, a lot more detail that we're waiting to receive from the U.S. Administration for Community Living um, that was the federal agency recipient of the funds. There is a total of $100 million nationally for elder justice, of which at this time, all we know is that at least 50 million of that will be for adult protective services. It might be more. And so at this time, since this is a new funding program at the federal level, they are needing to go through a lot more steps um, before we are aware of how much money uh, the Department of Human Services will receive from that as a, as a portion of, of the funding. Our understanding at this point is that the portion we'll, we will receive as a state will be using um, the formula at the federal level, um, which is a per capita formula that, um, that was agreed upon um, by Congress. And then we will receive our portion. And then um, uh, we will need to designate it for uh, COVID-related 
uh, interventions and services um, within adult protection. And so um, we're awaiting further guidance on that in terms of what um, parameters uh, each state will have in terms of determining how to um, how to administer the funds and then how would those be allocated potentially to the counties or, or in other ways, depending on the, the guidance that we receive. Thank you, Director Benson. Representative Robbins, do you have any follow-up? Okay. Thank, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Representative Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also have a question for Director Benson. Uh, Director Benson, I uh, noticed on page nine and 10 of your report, you, know, you discussed that the overall vulnerable adults reported through Mark have gone down 13% uh, over the course of the last year. And for those that are uh, being reported uh, to MDH down 21%, including our nursing homes. Um, but uh, I was wondering if you could explain that decrease in the uh, vulnerable adults reported, especially as we hear news reports about abuse, unfortunately, increasing uh, during uh, this pandemic time. And also given Ms. Uh, Vickstrom's uh, testimony today that, that their uh, center is actually receiving an increase in calls um, over the course of 2020. Director Benson. Madam Chair and members, um, we, we have been and continue to be very distressed by, by these numbers because what at least we know is that it is not an indication that abuse is not happening necessarily. If, if when we see this big of a difference, um, we, do, we do have guesses that it is related, at least in some of the settings, primarily for individuals who are not in a licensed setting, that it is potentially related to isolation, increased isolation, However, that, that's about as far as we feel we can go in terms of making um, some guesses at this point in terms of why. And so what we're currently doing um, in partnership with the Minnesota Elder Justice Center and, and our other stakeholders in the field, and of course, particularly the counties for us in our role, um, we are, are delving into the data that we do have available to see what we can figure out in terms of trends. Um, and, and what we're, what, what we have hoped for then, you know, with the, with the federal funding coming in, you know, although one time, uh, really can offer us the opportunity to, to really strategically fill in some gaps um, to, to try to shore, shore up these support systems. But um, at this time, I, I wish I had more definitive answers for you all and for the individuals in, in potentially um, you know, pretty risky situations, but um, we will continue to, to dive into it and, and, and learn more. Thank you, Director Benson. And I'm hoping that when we are able to implement the assisted living licensure, that um, that will help address some of this maltreatment. And so we're going to hear more about assisted living licensure rulemaking next Tuesday at our committee hearing, along with information on skilled nursing facilities. So I appreciate everyone's time today. Thank you for those excellent questions, representatives. I don't know, did you, Representative Rasmussen, I'm sorry, did you have a follow up? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to thank uh, Director Benson. I also share those concerns and um, would ask that uh, uh, Director Benson uh, keep this committee informed as we, uh, you know, try to understand what's going on with, um, you know, the, the decrease in reported abuse and what the administration can do and what we can do as a committee and a legislative body to, uh, to address um, those concerning numbers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Rasmussen. I know you're interested in, in, in long-term care and addressing these issues, so we appreciate that. Um, and members, we did also last session pass um, with bipartisan support legislation to give financial institutions more ability to stop payments when they sus suspected fraud. Um, so we are doing work in this area, but there's a lot more to do. Again, ha everybody have a great day. Our committee is adjourned and I look forward to seeing everyone next week. Bye-bye.